Welcome, everyone, to the MMA vivisection for UFC Pittsburgh. <laughs> Kicking with things me. off with a sigh. Yeah, well, it's been a, it's already been a somehow slightly long morning. I don't even know. Whatever. <laughs> um, welcome to the Uf to the MMA vivisection for UFC Pittsburgh with with myself, Zane Simon, and my co-host Connor Revish. We are here to talk about this upcoming UFC Fight Night card, which. Frankly, I like. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like we, I don't know, I feel the same way about this that I did about UFC 215, which is mm -hmm. that, like, I get that the bar has been raised a lot in the past couple of years. Seriously, just these are the, you know, people are only showing up for big fights, they're only showing up for big cards, and these cards are not that. But there's still a ton of shit on here that I'm really interested yeah. in. It's if there's two sides of the of the pos the spectrum of how a fight can be perceived, if it's or an event can be perceived, if it's huge tent pole event or it's guys fighting, then like this going head to head with Canelo versus Triple G is like the perfect parallel because this is a really good guys fighting card. This is like the perfection of that form where none of the fights stand out as being particularly amazing, but if you're a knowledgeable fight fan, you look up and down the lineup and you're pretty happy with it. And then Triple G Canelo, like, no one gives a shit who's fighting other than those guys. It's just for that event. But yeah. I think there's value in both. I mean, a lot of us are going to be watching Triple G Canelo, but you can be damn sure I'll be watching this on Sunday morning. Like, it looks like a pretty fun card, especially if I get to skip through things on Fight Pass or, or, or you know, on a, a DVR. Yeah, like if I had to make complaints, it would be about that uh, Shogun St. Pru 2 card next week. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, <laughs> There's you know, reason to complain about that. <laughs> the, the unfortunateness, the, the unfortunate fact that Claudia Gadella versus Jessica Andrade is sandwiched in the middle of it, which means that I'm going to have to watch a lot of stuff to watch, a, a lot of crap to watch one really good fight. It is essential by, by that description i would say it is the ufc's first bellator card <laughs> with just like a trash with a somewhat recognizable name in the main event like a really depressing main event between yeah. a faded star and someone who's never has been a star and then like one or two actually relevant interesting fights just sort of sprinkled in the card yeah that that would be a card you can play this even with the last minute changes that hurt it is still gonna be fun yeah, I think so, too. So let's dive in right at the bottom. Lightweight bout, Jason Sago, Gilbert Burns. Already excited for this fight. Yeah, it's an interesting fight, especially when you consider the possibility of these two guys tangling on the ground. Uh, no one has really successfully outgrappled Jason Sago. He has not won all of his UFC fights, but nobody has just tangled with his guard or with his uh, submission skills for long and beaten him. Uh, it's usually something most people avoid. Likewise for Gilbert Burns, who has also been up and down throughout his UFC career, but has a venomous submission. We still remember that uh, win in his UFC debut when he was way behind on the scorecards, getting beaten up, and still managed to find his submission against uh, Cowboy Oliveira. So Wait, uh, that wasn't his UFC debut, but yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Two after his UFC debut. That was Cowboy Oliveira's UFC debut. Yeah. Um. So... Was it? Am I wrong about that too? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just it was said, someone's debut. I right? said yes. It was Cowboy Oliver, as you said. Okay, good. <laughs> I got all insecure all of a sudden. Uh, so you know the grappling aspect of this fight is really interesting. The, the The wrinkle is how does it play out on the feet? Because it is it is weird that I could really see both men winning on the feet. I could see Gilbert Burns' sort of lack of connective tissue. Like he still doesn't seem to have a great grasp of the the nuances of striking like his mechanics are sharp he's clearly well trained you hit see this man hitting pads he looks like dynamite but when it's in the fight like you you talk about this a lot zane how you'll take a shot and the first thing that goes is your sense of distance and that seems to happen to gobert really easily and it doesn't seem to happen to jason sago but he's also not nearly as dangerous a striker as burns so I could see Sago just sort of moving around using his kicking game 
and outpointing Gilbert Burns on the feet and just sort of making him a little gun shy with his awkward striking. Ultimately, though, I think Burns' is wrestling is good enough that he will catch one of those kicks or find some opportunity to take this to the ground. And I have to assume that Burns, being a little bit better athlete um, and a little more vicious on the ground, I think, will have the edge there. But uh, I, I, I just hope that they go to the ground at some point. I do not want to see these two black belts kickboxing for 15 minutes. Yeah, it it would be a real shame if this ends up being a kickboxing match. If this yeah. ends up being Davi Ramos versus Sergio Marais. Yeah, pretty, sadly, I don't think that's an impossibility. But. It's not. It's not an impossibility because one of the things that I noticed in prep for this is Jason Sago's fight with Rustam Habalov. And Jason Sago did not wrestle in that fight. He did not try to. And obviously, there are good, sensible reasons for that. It's Rustam Habalov. He's basically a fire hydrant with spin kicks. Um, <laughs> but it still, it's never a good thing to see a fighter who has a core aspect to his game. Because, I mean, Jason Sago is not a bad wrestler. He's a pretty good one. He's actually, like, a pretty good wrestle grappler as his core set. Yeah. Um, it's not good to see if a fighter have a core, have core skills and then not be able to use them because of the wrong matchup. Mm-hmm. Like you want to see them adjust and adapt them to the matchup and say right. like, okay, well I'm going to wrestle like this because this guy is tough to take down, or I'm going to grapple like this. Cause this guy's a good grappler. You don't want to see a fight where somebody's like, oh, you, you don't want to see Davi Ramos versus Sergio Marias, where it's like, yeah. okay, you're both amazing grapplers, and neither of you are willing to test that. Like, yeah. and I, But I think that might be the difference here. Like, That's why I have to favor Burns, is yeah. that I, I think Sago is willing to be neutralize, to neutralize people if he can and end up kind of neutralizing some of his own skills yeah. as well, whereas Burns tends to go after people if he can. Yeah, because Sago standing is otherwise he's a he's a kick first yeah. striker. And as such, he tend you know, it's the it's the it's that weird skill set of the kick striker grappler yeah. who uses his kicks to keep a really long distance and then uses that to shoot from way outside and then chains his takedowns really well after it. Yeah. And it doesn't make him a dangerous striker. It makes right. him uh, some. You know, he doesn't. He's not somebody who gets knockout. His TKOs are ground and pound. I think almost in- exclusively. Yeah, pretty sure. And so I, you know, I don't think he can catch Burns there. I think Burns, even even if maybe uh, Henry Hooft in his corner isn't the best thing, his continued work at Combat Club under Hooft is only going to help continue advancing his striking game and then yeah burns i have almost no doubt will be willing to wrestle especially if sago's not coming forwards i think that you know the thing we saw in the preseris fight is if you're a hard puncher and you're willing to come after burns he kind of will just sort of fade away and acquiesce to a kickboxing match Mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to wrestle off his back foot but if he feels like he can get a little space and he can d- dictate pace a little more. I assume he's going to set up a lot more offense. Yeah. It's like Sago is part of this weird generation that grew up listening to Joe Rogan talk about how fighters with good guards don't have to worry about throwing kicks. <laughs> and so then he's like, well, that means I don't have to learn to punch. So I'll just only throw kicks. And if they take me down, it leaves him in this kind of awkward position if they don't take him down. Uh, or if they take him down on their terms, yeah, because th- the game is just not—it's not proactive enough. No, yeah. Uh, odds on that fight: Sago is the slight underdog, opening at plus one forty, adjusting straight down to minus one hundred three, and slowly rising to plus one twelve. Not a lot of change in that line after the initial adjustment. Burns opening at minus 180, adjusting up to minus 123, and slowly fading to minus 138. So I I would see Burns as a little bigger favorite here, considering that Sago is not a knockout artist Mm -hmm. and not an easy points round winner standing, not the kind of guy who clearly takes 
rounds away from people standing and yeah. is really unlikely to just out grapple burns yeah yeah but i i am i i mean saga is not to be overlooked though burns has been shaky no. enough that i wouldn't like to see him as a massive favorite either no so. i wouldn't see him as a massive favorite either it's just you look at the two people that have really shut down gilbert burns rashid magomedov and M michelle Pizaris. yeah and they are these tank like uber wrestle you know guys who punch hard and who can who could really like put him on his back foot and make him think yeah and especially if in in magomedov's case like whose answer to burns is wrestling is to stifle him and keep hitting him rather than to fall down and try to grapple with him yeah right like sago has a great guard but he, he couldn't submit paul felder with his guard he's probably not going to submit gilbert burns no and so yeah, it, it just it seems like a it, it's Burns isn't a safe bet, but it's a bad matchup for Saga. Right. Yeah, stylistically, I think so. Brings us to a bantamweight bout: Luke Saunders, Felipe Arantes. Also, love this fight. Really mm -hmm. looking forward to this one a lot. Um, We're both probably maybe like uh, the North America's only two fans of Felipe Arantes. <laughs> yeah. Like. You and I, maybe it's your fault that we, because we also have Sergio Marais on this card, who now, thanks to you, I am also a fan of. But I, I, I love the, the weird, scrappy Brazilians. Yeah, I love these Brazilian guys. I mean, because, like, the Brazilian circuit, you don't have an amateur game at all. You don't have uh, a heavy wrestling history. And you have a ton of people who get started really young with a lot of grappling and a lot of Muay Thai. Mm-hmm. And you just get these weird games amalgamated out of that. Like they have yeah. to, there's so much adjusting that has to be done to make that game work at the UFC level that the people who do, they tend to be these kind of fun, weird fighters to watch. Yeah. And, and because with like a kind of unstructured, but still very uh, thriving MMA scene in Brazil, like the ones who float to the top tend to be the baddest. Like they tend to be really scrappy, yeah. really game and really tough. And, and have a lot of killer instinct. And guys like Arantes and even Marais, um, and also like, uh, who's the little uh, muscular, little Brazilian, bald head, power puncher that we also both like? I'll look him up. Oh. Weird sort of stiff, janky style. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, oh, what is his name now? <laughs> Sorry for the digression, but he fits uh, the bill as well. Like, yeah. Shockingly tough and scrappy that like these people these people like people like Arantes are, are very tough to outfight. And that's yep. what makes it so compelling. That they get to the top of that weird scene because they're just naturally good fighters. Yeah. And they get a ton of experience too. So by the mm -hmm. time they're in the UFC, like they're crafty. They know mm -hmm. how to you know, you get guys, even like somebody like Godafredo Pepe, who's just this once again, this weird sort of janky style, and it's just yeah. all like high octane, super dangerous stuff that you have to watch for. Sure. So, and on the other side, I'm at, I'm also a really big fan of Luke Sanders. Mm -hmm. Like he, he kind of got a late start to MMA. He's already 31, mm. but he's a guy that at least, and I don't know, He's a guy that I have high hopes for not being able to necessarily win a belt, but to be a top ranked fighter in the bantamweight division. Yeah. And, you know, what he was doing to Yuri Alcantara early in that fight gives me a lot of hope in that vein. He obviously, he ended up losing by knee bar, but that was like a amazing comeback submission from. Yeah. And a fight that justifiably could have been stopped in his favor on a few occasions. Yeah. So Sanders is, he's, you know, this ultra athletic, very fast, very powerful, very well rounded, but not deep anywhere fighter whose main, you know, his main abilities are just to have a continual, a continual aggressive flow. So he'll, you know, he'll come in behind strikes. It's almost always just hard one twos over and over again. And then he'll push for the clinch and then he'll pick somebody up and he'll slam them and he'll get on top of them and he'll go to straight to ground and pound. And it's just this continual flow of aggression. If they get up, he'll get back up with them and he'll start to try to wrestle them again. He'll reset and start throwing hard punches and kicks again. And it's very hard to deter him. You, you have to do something like catch him in a knee bar. Mm-hmm. 
And it probably makes, I mean, it's going to make for a fantastic fight with Felipe Aranches, who is kind of the same guy, but without the wrestling. Mm -hmm. But he does have the knee bars. He's got the leg locks. He has the leg locks, but he doesn't have the ability to dictate the arena of the fight. Right. He's, and, you know, so he's this offensive Muay Thai fighter who's really only at his best when he's wading forward dangerously throwing combinations. And those combinations are fun. They are tend to be like three or four strikes, but they also put him in a lot of danger of getting hit. And they put him in a lot of danger of getting taken down because he has no qualms about just going and throwing a flying knee in the middle of him or, you know, throwing a kick without any setup or... Oh, yeah. Like six naked low kicks in a row. He yeah. will happily do that kind of stuff. Just whatever he can to press a fight on people. And it's led, you know, a lot of his losses are because he just can't keep control of where the fight's taking place. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably going to happen against Sanders as well. Sanders is hard to hurt. He's got a great chin. And, you know, he's not the most defensively sound fighter on the planet. But he's fast and he's reasonably has a reasonable enough idea of what he's doing and have have of spacing and timing to not just sit there and eat shots and more than likely he'll get a takedown and if he gets on top of Arancha or gets the chance to control him his ability to carry a pace and to work from everywhere is going to likely carry him through this fight it could be that he gets submitted Arancha is crafty off of his back but um, he throws up arm bars, does it really well. But he's not amazing off of his back. He's not the same kind of uh, grappler, even as Yuri Alcantara. He's not a god afraid of Pepe. He's somebody who goes to a few things and he does it quickly. But I, I think if Luke Sanders is minding that, especially after his last fight, he should have a pretty clear route to win. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm more or less with you. Um, I, I think the, really the big thing, like the the big tactical node, as Greg Jackson would call it, that stands out to me are Arantes' kicks. Like the double edged sword is that without his kicks, I don't think Felipe Arantes is really Felipe Arantes on the feet. Like that's a big part of his striking game. He's got devastating low kicks. He mixes them up really well. Um, and then the 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 good news is i guess i don't think he'll give up his kicks because he's felipe aranches the bad news is that that leaves him extremely vulnerable to the wrestling of luke sanders that's the big difference in this fight uh both guys are like a good mixture of vulnerable and offensively ca- uh, capable in basically every phase except wrestling heavily favors sanders and if yep. he can get aranches down He's probably not going to submit him. I mean, there is going to be an opportunity for like leg locks and stuff always against a guy like Sanders. And maybe someday somebody's going to catch like Khabib Nurmagomedov and Mirsad Bektic in those leg locks too. There's probably something to be said for a fighting style that sort of necessitates that you be standing over your opponent as they scramble so you can hit them. That means you're always going to be vulnerable to having your legs grabbed. But like, you know, Yuri Alcantara is not Felipe Aranches, and I would imagine Luke Sanders would at least be a little more prescient. Like last time, he seemed very much caught by surprise yeah. when Alcantara made his first move of the last four minutes and went for that submission. Uh, the same thing happening again is just too unlikely to count on. And so I think, again, while I, it'll be a good fight and both guys should be competitive mm-hmm. stylistically, you've got to favor Luke Sanders. Yeah. And because. Uh, Arantes has classically had a pretty fantastic chin. He's never been knocked out. And because Sanders has a great chin, I expect this to be like three rounds of just kind of crazy scrambles where Sanders gets takedowns, Arantes throws up arm bars, maybe clears and works his way back up to the feet, and Sanders goes after him again and eats a few shots. and should just be a fun fight. Yeah, Sanders is a guy who, given an opponent who will not just lie there and take it, is always good for a fun fight because he's all offense. As you said, he is going to keep bringing the fight to Aranchis and Aranchis is too scrappy to give up unless he is separated from consciousness. Yep. Uh, odds on that fight. Felipe Aranchis is the underdog. Uh, opened at plus 180 and 
went up to plus one as high as plus 199 at one point but has since fallen back to plus 179 so a lot of movement up and down on that line to get us basically right back where we are right now <laughs> and luke sanders opened at minus 260 and uh has went up to minus adjusted up to minus 234 stayed pretty level there for a while and is now up to minus 220 so money slowly coming in on Arantius, i guess yeah the lines keep falling i think sanders might be worth a look if he's below 200 then maybe sanders is worth a look yeah because again Arantius is Arantius is scrappy but he's gonna have to really catch sanders the way alcantara did to have a good chance of beating him it's hard to imagine him winning the rounds yeah um uh, all right oh geez my dog's about to start barking so i'm gonna <laughs> quickly introduce the middleweight bout yatko hall you okay <laughs> while zane jiggles his dog treat so that his dog will be silent uh christoph jocko uriah hall is to me a really compelling fight i know jocko's last fight against dave branch um who is now fighting in the main event of this card was not great in fact it was really really slow and tedious and both guys are to blame for that. Uh, Jotko did seem, however, to really struggle with the sort of airtight wrestling of Branch in that fight. He struggled not really to defend all of it, but to get his game going and defend it. Um, he spent so much effort defending it that he just couldn't make enough happen to overcome Branch's very slight momentum. Uh, but normally, I think Jocko is a lot more entertaining. Even if he's not necessarily an action fighter, given the right kind of matchup, he can put on some really good flashy performances. Uh, and I think Uriah Hall is probably the right kind of opponent for that. The, the interesting thing, too, is that Hall tends to be at his best in a sort of range kickboxing matches, even when he's losing them. Like, um, I don't know, Robert Whitaker destroyed like a higher ranked fighter, like, <sighs> um, <laughs> like, uh, what was Whitaker's big, uh, like, not a breakout, big knockout win? Middleweight. Uh, I'm blanking on names right now. He knocked him out with a head kick and then a right hand. Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson, yeah. And Derek Brunson beat Uriah Hall. But the reason MMA math doesn't work is that Uriah Hall looks pretty good himself against Robert Whitaker. Given that type of style matchup, he had a pretty competitive fight with the guy who's now the interim champion. So I think if Jotko allows Hall space to work, especially because Hall is still by strides, I think, getting better with his sort of distance management and his strike selection. He's a little savvier than he used to be. Then I think we could be in for a really exciting fight on the feet. Uh, the chain, the, the game changer here, as in the sanders Arantes fight, is probably Jocko's wrestling. It doesn't really get a ton of credit, but he is a fantastically skilled takedown artist. He times and sets up his takedowns. He's got a whole wide array of different shots and entries uh, and they tend to be the kind of takedowns that catch you by surprise so that he ends up in side control or in half guard or in some other good position of dominant control. So Hall is going to be dangerous for Jotko and can probably pick up rounds if Jotko just consents to strike with him on the feet. But if Jotko can create scrambles, even Hall's improved grappling is probably not enough considering what Jotko did, you know, to like, um, Oh my God, me and names today. What he did to Talis Lytus uh, on the oh, ground. It's hard to imagine someone in the middleweight division easily out grappling him if he's on top. So with the wrestling advantage, I give the fight advantage to Jotko. I think he'll probably win by unanimous decision. But I think it'll be a tactical and interesting fight. Yeah, it's, um, I, I think one of the key things here for Jotko and why he kind of what really screwed him up against uh, Branch is that he really likes, and you know, this is part of his wrestling approach and part of, I think, his game overall, is that he, even when he has kickboxed from range in the past, what he wants is an avenue to get into the clinch or to mm -hmm. get in on takedowns. Like what he, his goal with his kickboxing is to pressure and to push the person back and then either, you know, force an opening to take them down or be able to press them up against the clinch, into the clinch and start working to take them down. Or if it's against a guy like Scott Askham, they might lunge after him on the feet and he can counter them with the takedown. But Branch yeah. didn't really, he didn't really lunge. 
and he, you know. And then once he got to the clinch, he yeah. was just more power. He was just better. Right. A, he's a better wrestler, frankly. I mean, yeah. maybe it's more powerful and being an equally good wrestler, but he was bigger and stronger and better able to enact the same game there and shut down Jotko's game than Jotko yeah. was to work a game there. And, and Branch is a neutralizer to begin with. He happened yeah. to have pretty much the perfect makeup to neutralize Jotko. <laughs> he basically allowed neither man to do anything interesting. <laughs> Uriah Hall struggles when mm. people back him up and when yeah. people push him uh, back to the fence when they get get in on him and they can smother him when they don't, you know, when they don't let him just have the range and the ability to feel out whatever he wants going on at distance. And even there, he doesn't keep a great pace or have the most process driven game. He tends to, you know, throw a lot of one shot spin kicks, work behind a jab occasionally, but it's always looking for that one opportunity to throw something surprising and to throw somebody off. And I think that Yatko is just too much of a pressure fighter to let that happen. Hall could catch him the way he caught Musasi. You, you know, there's always that chance with somebody like Uriah Hall. But, uh, you know, it's also something to be said for the fact that Musasi is very much this sort of, has a habit of being a sort of plod forward slow paced fighter from range who is willing to just kind of stand and see what's going on and walk in and really uh, feel his own way into the fight slowly. He gave Hall some opportunities that I don't think Yatko is even Yatko is going to give. I think Yatko is probably just going to go out and try to push Uriah Hall against the fence and try to take him down or if not take him down, try to get him in the clinch and work a clinch game and do whatever he can to make your eye hall feel pressure. Do you, do you think Jotko can steadily come forward if Hall all, cause Hall likes to come forward sometimes too. Do you think if he tries to be aggressive that Jotko will, because Jotko is also often happy to play the sort of outfighters defensive role as well. Yeah. I, I think that if, I I have a lot less faith in Hall's ability to maintain pressure than Yatko's. Sure, yeah, that's fair. I think that's what it comes down to. Is it mm -hmm. even when Hall has had like I'm trying to think back? I feel like even his fight against Oluwali Bamboj, he conceded a lot of pressure to Bamboj early, who came at when Bamboj came after. And maybe I'm misremembering that, but. He does tend to, though. When somebody's aggressive, he tends to back up. Yeah. It, it's And Yatko is much more like he can be defensive and stay out, but it's something that if he wants to pressure, if he feels like he can, I think he sticks to it. And I don't think, you know, and Hall classically, he's Hall's had trouble sticking to anything in terms of a game yeah. over the course of a fight. Yeah, the only thing that worries me is that I kind of expected Jocko to do that to Branch. Like, I don't think still that that was an unwinnable stylistic matchup for Jocko. It was just that he kind of just fought like typical Christoph Jocko. I, I think I was hoping that we'd see, like, the, the, the best we've seen of aggressive Jocko was in the Lightest fight. Yeah. He was mean. You know, he was out there to beat up Talos Lightus, and he was very aggressive. But it, ha it doesn't always show up from him either. So well, I'm just the, the question would be in that fight, is that just a matter of a difference of pressure and clinch success? Where against Lightus, he had a lot of success being able sure. to put pressure forward and when he got the clinch, turn that into takedowns. And against Branch, when you know it, the it, the exchanges early were pretty neutral, and then when he tried to pressure forward and get takedowns. Uh, he got caught off guard by the first takedown. That kind of set the tone. And sure, after yeah. that, he just could not work his game inside. Yeah, I think you might be right. So, uh, but, you know, there's always a chance with Uriah Hall. That's always the thing with him. It's just, I, another, I remember another fluke kick. 
The, the thing with, I remember Gegard Musashi, when he knocked out Musashi, he was like, well, there's the new bar that will keep people saying your eye hall can win any fight for the next <laughs> five years as he fails to win most of his fights. <laughs> so I, I'm not picking him here. Uh, hall opened at plus 170, has gone up and down a little, and is currently at plus 170. So not a lot of movement there. Uh, Yatko opened at minus 230, adjusted up to minus 211, and is now at minus 210. So I think that's about right. Yeah, Yatko deserves to be a reasonable favorite. Um, Hall gets a little play for being dynamic and unpredictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. By the way, the guy we were thinking of before is Douglas Silva de Andrade. Yeah, Douglas de Silva. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like, I love that dude. It's weird as hell game, but... Mm-hmm. One of two fire hydrants we've discussed. Do you think... Uh, so instead of... I guess he's got the spinning back fist. Rustam Kabalov is a fire hydrant with spinning kicks. Do you think both of them would fit in well in, like, 70s Bronx? <laughs> fire hydrant, spinning kicks. I think both would, like, blend right in, really, to that environment. Very Definitely. Back Absolutely. in the Kung Fu Bronx. <laughs> okay. No, we're not meditating that any further. <laughs> Too weird. Like Too the weird. Warriors, man. You know, like 70s Bronx. I, I, like I, 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 I know. I know. <laughs> Just... yeah, so you're saying that like uh, Douglas De Silva would be one of the electric eliminators? <laughs> yes. Is there something strange about me calling back to a passing remark you made about a fighter who isn't on this card two fights ago? I mean, is that your problem here, Zane? No. That I'm still talking about your <laughs> stomach of a love? No. No, it's not. All right. <laughs> it's typical at this point. Heavyweight bout, Anthony Hamilton, Daniel Spitz. Can we make sure to talk about this one for a very long time? Yeah, no. <laughs> I think this okay. is really the people's main event. I uh, get every Hamilton fight <laughs> wrong. All of them. Yes, yes. And I always will. So I am picking Anthony Hamilton because Daniel Spitz is not a good MMA fighter mm-hmm. in any sense. And... uh that's it. Yep. Dan- Daniel Spitz is literally, in, in the same way that Chad Laprise is secretly the perfect TriStar fighter, even though he's not a TriStar really anymore, Daniel Spitz is the perfect uh, Rick. <laughs> What's Rick's name? From oh. uh, from yeah. Washington. You know sick the team. Jitsu. Yeah, the Sick Jitsu. He is the perfect Sick Jitsu. Rick Little. The perfect Sick Jitsu Rick Little fighter because he is tough and literally very little else. <laughs> like, He's, he's extremely durable. He has some natural fighting ability. Like, he, he can place a shot at range. He's fairly agile for a man of his build, I guess. But it just looks like nobody's done any work developing a game for him. Yeah, um, he can't wrestle. He tries to all the time. I don't know that yeah. he's ever successfully gotten a takedown as a yeah. dude. tries to wrestle constantly. And he has a jab that works because he's big and tall. But he has no strikes yeah. that follow up after it. It's all single shots, no plan, no flow chart to follow. Chin and way up and out. Yeah. Anthony Hamilton's a little crude, but like he, he's got Jackson Wink. He has a little bit of that. He knows how to change up his style to suit different opponents. And he's also just a tank who is just going to run his forehead into the chest of Daniel Spitz and try to maul him from the opening. It could end up with Anthony Hamilton being knocked out in seconds. Sure. uh, Because sometimes that happens. Half the time. Half the time it happens. (laughs) Half the time that's what happens. But I agree with you. I'm taking Hamilton over Spitz. I think he'll probably get him out of there in the first or second round. Yeah. Hamilton is the favorite. Open minus 230, adjusted up to minus 211, and slowly moved up to minus 206. And uh, Spitz, the underdog, opened at plus 170 and has slowly dropped down to plus 167. Huh. That's whatever. It's heavyweight. <laughs> Nothing more needs to be said. Uh, lightweight bout next. Tony Martin, Olivier Aubin Mercier. This is a good-ass fight. It is. Um, especially because Tony Martin has been on fire lately. Uh, and Tony Martin has been on fire, and he's confident as hell about being oh, on yeah. fire. Yeah, he knows he's on fire. Like Tony Martin spent the first several years of his career, like fighting in, was he in Alaska or something? He was, um, I don't know, fighting in some regional promotions and just kind of being a big dude who could who struggled with his weight and 
was a grappler who tired out because he used strength and everything. The game wasn't clicking, and he can tell now that the game is clicking. And you can see that in the fight with Johnny Case, which was really a dynamite performance from Tony Martin. And John, Johnny Case put on a very good fight as well. I mean, he was in good form that night. They had a good contest, but Tony Martin outstruck Johnny Case. He went in there and he outstruck him. And it wasn't just because he was a big dude. He used his frame really well. He had a great jab. He was timing counter right hands beautifully. I mean, the kind of stuff you would never have imagined from the guy who got just, uh, you know, mercilessly shit kicked by Rashid Magomedov in his first UFC fight after gassing, going for submission. So he's a different Tony Martin now. And I think that makes about with Olivia Alba Mercier really compelling because Olivia Alba Mercier is this fighter who is clearly still struggling to make things work on the feet, but has been more effective with his style than Martin was before by being a powerful grappler. Um, yeah. he, he's kind of the more ideal version of what Martin was before, and Martin's kind of a more ideal version of what Alba Mercier wants to become. So it's interesting. Uh, I like Tony Martin in this fight. I think being more comfortable on the feet in addition to his size disadvantage, now that he's not gassing out so quickly anymore, now that he seems confident and comfortable and doesn't get shaken when he's hit with a strike, um, I, I have a hard time seeing Alban Mercier just repeatedly taking him down and manhandling him on the ground. I think Martin's technically very good on the ground. He's very big and strong, and he's a good wrestler too. Uh, so then it comes down to kickboxing, and I'm actually excited to see these two grapplers kickbox, and I think in that kind of fight, Tony Martin will take the decision. Yeah, I, there, Avin Mercier is probably a little better athlete. Um, hits harder, I think, just naturally. Possible. Martin was landing some heat in that last fight, though. I think he's coming he along. But Avin Mercier has the kind... I th I've seen flashes of power from him where it's like, even though you don't really know what you're doing, you still hit hard. Yeah, and it's definitely and different it, kinds of power. Avin yeah. Mercier is the athletic like sudden shock of power and martin is as his <laughs> as his technique comes along martin is just learning how to put his weight into his punches but when you're a like a i don't know how tall is tony martin when you're you know six foot tall and probably weigh in you know like at least 30 pounds over the fight weight then knowing how to put your weight into your punches does matter yeah so on, you're right alban mercier ath athletically is superior yeah, Aubin Mercy is a better athlete. He probably hits a little harder. Oh, God damn it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> the thing is, is that, you know, he he's never been comfortable a comfortable enough striker to really make that count. Like, it, his, his fight with Drew Dober, his last bout, is the fight where he really made that count for the first time by outstriking Drew Dober a lot and forcing Drew Dober to have to wrestle with him. But that also gets to the problem of why I'm not picking Aubin Mercier here. So he still wouldn't. He's still not a great striker. He's still somebody that can get hit. Martin is not an elite striker, but has made bigger strides there. And Aubin Mercier wants to strike. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, him him beating Drew Dober there, that's not a function of like, oh, well, you know, he he wanted to test his striking or whatever, and he could grapple him and any time kind of thing. This is a consistent thing that uh, Aubin Mercier has been working to do for multiple fights now. He always wants to test his striking. He's the new yeah. Josh Koscheck in a way. Like, there's a reason that he went three rounds with Tibal Guti, you know? Yeah. It's not because Guti, even though Guti looked better last time out, it's not because that was like a hard matchup for him. There's a reason that he went three rounds with David Michaud and Tony Sims, people who are not nearly as good a grappler as he is. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing. Like, I don't think he can depend on out grappling Martin enough that waiting for like waiting for the fight to go late and for things to like go poorly for himself can really be a viable long-term option for him in this bout. Yeah. I think if I think if he went, ran out of the gate and just said, I am going to grapple you until, you know, I, I'm going to make you grapple me to Tony Martin, 
that could be a really smart move. Mm -hmm. It might tire him out. Yeah, it could pit like Martin. A lot of what has made Martin's cardio better could be. I mean, it could be better training. It could also be better management of not going nuts and going out and just trying to strong arm sub people because you know it's not like Tony Martin goes out and is like, oh, let me put on this slick jujitsu clinic of these amazing like back takes and things like that. He's like, okay, let, let's go out and I'm going to try and slap an Americana on you. Rip and a dude's arm off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's both. Martin has talked a lot yeah. about finally getting a dietitian to manage his weight yeah. cut, which is obviously a considerable weight cut given his size. Yeah. But it's clear that like being composed and knowing how to th- like, it's way easier to win a fight throwing a hundred jabs around than it is even if you're a grappler to grapple strenuously for just five minutes because yeah. it's a jab is easy. It's efficient. So Aubin Mercier's cardio has largely been pretty good. Mm-hmm. And if he went out and just tried to make this a track meet grappling match of who can last the longest in a bunch of speed scrambles, I think he could win that fight for sure. I don't think he fights that fight though. And so that I have to pick Tony Martin. Yeah. I'm with you all the way. Um, odds on this fight, Martin is a very, very minor underdog, opening at plus 135, dropping down to plus 101, and staying pretty stable there now at minus 104. Aubin Mercier opening at minus 175, adjusting up to minus 130, and now rising slowly to minus 120, so... These odds are adjusting close to dead even. Um, I don't know. I like Martin's chances here. I think he could easily be a favorite in this fight. Yeah, I agree. I'm not sure if it's a, if like dead even odds is enough to put a lot of value on Martin because he is still developing. He's not. Both these guys are not finished products yet. I don't think. But um, I do think he deserves to be the favorite. So he he might be. I might place a small bet on Tony Martin. Yeah. Are there any props? A uh, ton of props, I'm sure. Let's see. Uh, not a ton, but a few. Let's see, Aubin Mercier inside the distance is plus 275. Martin inside the distance is plus 411. Uh, over two and a half rounds, minus 220. Under two and a half, plus 180. There's, you know, fight goes yeah. to decision, fight is a draw, and. Uh, so and so wins by de- Aubin Mercier wins by decision. Martin wins by decision. But I don't think yeah, it it's not a super battable fight. I mean, I think like even though dead even odds don't really paint the right picture, they seem to kind of kind of make it hard to take advantage of the matchup. Yeah. Um. All right, that brings us to a heavyweight bout main card now. Justin Ledet Zhu An An Yanwu. And uh, this is a much clearer version of the Anthony Hamilton and Daniel Spitz. But it's like, it's kind of like if Anthony Hamilton versus Daniel Spitz included a Daniel Spitz that was actually a really good fighter. <laughs> if Daniel Spitz was the guy that, like, Rick Little has probably stopped him from being, then he might be Justin Ledet. Yeah. Um this should be a pretty simple pick for Ledet. The big thing with Zuan uh, uh, Anyanwu is that he seems to be tough, and he seems to be he seems to hit hard and throw hard and be willing to wade forward. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't have any sense of timing or distance or management, and uh, his gas tank seems pretty typical of a under trained heavyweight. He seems like the heavyweight one, another heavyweight that's kind of fighting himself into shape slowly over his career. And Ledet is a weird dude. He extra- he strikes me as an exceptionally weird dude in like all ways. You know, the kind of dude who shaves his head down to like a, a one and then leaves a mullet from like here halfway down the skull. Yeah. Ledet, you would not be shocked if Ledet like came out walked out into his driveway in the morning to get his paper and he was wearing like a kimono. Like that's no. what he wears around the house. That would be very much in tune with his character. <laughs> yeah. Or, or if his house was like a brightly painted RV. <laughs> yeah. I would not very be brightly. shocked. No, I wouldn't be shocked. 
on the flip side, Ledette is a good athlete. He's tough as hell, and he's a sharp boxer, mm -hmm. much more so than I gave him credit for. And a uh, scrambling grappler, like somebody who seems like they're really getting MMA now taking their as they've taken their career more seriously. What happened with Ledette? Didn't he um didn't he fail a drug test in that last fight? He, he popped for weed. Oh, okay. Who gives a shit? In okay. Texas, who didn't update yeah. I think Texas like hadn't updated their commission regulations where like everybody else said the threshold for weed is now much higher because that shit's dumb and we don't care. And Texas was like, oh, whatever, we use the old standard. Everybody failed. I'd like to see one of these Texas commissioners live in a brightly painted RV all day and not smoke weed. Indeed. <laughs> um, but yeah, he, you know, what he's done, to Ch what he did to Chase Sherman, like this seems like a lot like the Chase Sherman fight to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, An Anyamu might hit a little harder, but also be more foot slow. Yeah. And otherwise, it's a fight that I don't see Anyanwu having uh, having a sol an easy solution to change his game up to have something other than walk in on Justin Ledette and keep eating a bunch of punches for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm with you. Anyanwu's toughness is really his biggest advantage here. If Ledette does not take him seriously, if Ledette, who has a tendency to fight a little cocky, you know, like leaves his chin hanging out there, Anyanwu could certainly make him pay for that, but Ledet strikes you as a guy who's cocky only when he knows he's a much better boxer than his opponents. And as a guy with legit pro boxing experience and a few years of training in that sport, that's usually the case when it comes to fighting like regional level MMA heavyweights, that he is the superior boxer. He's got a good jab, quick hands. His defense isn't that nuanced, but he keeps his damn hands up. And lo and behold, that shit works at heavyweight. Like, just hugging your head with your gloves, popping out a jab, and smacking somebody on the side of the head when they lunge after you with a left hook is basically all Ledette needs to beat a fighter like Anyanwu. I think we're going to see Ledette moving, keeping Anyanwu on the end of his jab, and uh, just basically forcing him to chase until he wears him down. He might get a finish if he can rack up enough damage, but Anyanwu is tough enough that we're probably looking at a decision win for Justin Ledette, but I'm expecting a pretty one-sided decision. Zane, All right. Waiting Sorry. for the dog? <laughs> yeah. We forgot to tell him that we were recording late today. Otherwise, of I, course... This thing, she is crazy as shit. <laughs> All right, there was a squirrel, apparently, and now her hackles are up, and she's running around the room frantically. <laughs> She's not. All right. She doesn't want the squirrel. She's threatened by the squirrel. <laughs> She's afraid. Ledette uh, opened at minus three fifteen. Is now up to minus three ninety two. Uh, Anyamwu opened at plus two thirty five. Is now up to plus three oh three. So I don't think the odds should get too too long because it's heavyweight and there's always a chance that Ledette gets cocky and trusts his chin too much because he does trust it a lot and just gets knocked out or something mm -hmm. but on a pure skill perspective he really should have this fight wrapped is up. there a is there a total like an over under for total time uh over a round and a half is minus 145 under plus 125 that, that might be the way to find value. Like, I think yeah. both guys are probably tough enough that it'll probably go past a round at least. Probably. Ledette's not a hard, the hardest striker. He doesn't right. tend to knock people out. So Right. It's all speed and snap, so he's the one who's going to be landing more, but Anyanu is tough enough that he can take a bunch of snappy shots for a while. So what, over one and a half at minus 140 is not bad. Indeed. All right. Uh Brings us to a welterweight bout, Kamaru Usman, Sergio Marais. This is also a fight I like. I mean, this has a chance to be a really bad fight. Why why they do that? The, why are they doing this to our boys, Zane? I know. <laughs> but I'm excited because I think this is probably one of the few times in recent memory that somebody's just gonna go out and say, fuck it, I'll I'll wrestle Sergio Marais. True. And that has me excited because yeah, Sergio Marais, I like him. 
He's got this weird striking style that, like, it doesn't seem like it should work, but he wins all of his fights, and he does it in part because people think that he's got... They expect him to be this easy-to-read striker who's yeah not very good, and his technique is sloppy, but he's got good timing, and yeah. he knows how to, like, change things up and find the right time to throw a weird strike, and catches people often the difference between weird striking and bad striking is just whether or not it works yeah. and Marias is, is not good looking but it tends to work yep like he he you know there's a reason he hasn't beat all the best competition but he's not losing either he's not dropping mm-hmm. random fights mm-hmm. um thing is here is that Usman is very much has very much become over the course of his UFC career, a no bullshit fighter. You know, that's a lot. I think behind that uh, combat club, Henry hoofed training mentality, uh, something I think that does really good for a fighter like Usman, who has had a ton of career success already in other things. You know, we've talked about this before. We talk about it every time a uh, hoof trained fighter comes up, but I think that fighters who've had a lot of success in other combat sports tend to really do well on, with what hoof is bringing them because mm-hmm. they they don't have, like, they can't be rattled. So they don't get any of the bad parts of his confidence breaking. Yeah. And they I also think get, he, he runs his sessions like a wrestling room. Like, yeah. He's a take no shit, do your drills, work hard kind of coach. I think a lot of people who come from dedicated combat sports backgrounds respond to that. Yeah. And I think Kamar Usman, like he's only it's only showed up well for him in his fights. As a guy who has always been a little bit of a wooden striker, mm-hmm. he has had a lot of faith in his chin and a lot of faith in his hands and in his ability to work behind strikes, and it's carried him through his career. Mm-hmm. And I think that that'll play big for him against Marias. I, I think that Marias, he's he's a very good grappler, but there's something to be said about also not getting submissions recently. Like he's, it, you know, it becomes one of those things where fighters are just like, well, I shouldn't test that guy's grappling because I know he's good at it. And it's like, well, I mean, if you can put him on his back, you know, if you if you're confident enough in in your ability to shut down a guard game, maybe you should. Maybe you shouldn't yeah. just engage in a bad kickboxing match with this guy for three rounds. Especially when the dudes can hit each other. I'll take a wrestler in half guard over a jujitsu black belt on bottom in half guard when the dudes can hit each other. Yeah, for sure. It makes yeah like that. I, I don't think that people should treat guards never going to come back in that way no. in MMA no. where it is worth it to to look at an opponent that you outmatch in many areas and think i cannot grapple with them yeah and you've seen we've seen you know even against guys like Sean Strickland, Warley Alves and Alexander Yakovlev who are all reasonably strong grapplers um Kamaru Usman just came out and put it on him just yeah. shut him down got on top did work put him against the fence whatever he needed to do. And I think this is that kind of fight for him. So I'm hoping that he really goes after Marias and doesn't stay back and say, oh, I shouldn't attack this guy because I don't want to get wrapped up in his grappling game. Yeah, I'd be shocked if Usman treated any opponent with that much respect or anxiety. Like, wh- whether it's Khabib Nurmagomedov or Sergio Marias, Usman, I think, is going after you and trying to play his game which is i think what makes him so effective like uh p- i think people have been waiting for a big breakout win from musman and the strickland win could have been that for some people and they're like well you know it was uh for me like he doesn't need a breakout win all of his wins are the same yeah and that's kind of a really good selling point of his it's like how does he manage to have the exact same fight against all of these different people with all these different styles because he just does his thing oh. and i don't want to like disparage um, any combat sports, uh, and certainly not Gilbert Burns, who is a really nice guy and seems to have also helped put together a great team at Combat Club. I know that's his gym, but maybe there's something to be said for combat sports background 
that the difference between a wrestler training under a guy like Henry Hooft and a jiu-jitsu guy training under a guy like Henry Hooft is that the wrestler just does his damn thing. Um, Kamar Usman is just like a nose-to-the-grindstone type of fighter. And it's hard to imagine Marais, who has relied on his opponent's sort of anxieties and trepidation, reacting all that well to that. So I love Marais, but I think Usman's going to get after him and start making him work a lot more than anyone has in years from the opening bell. So I like Usman, and I think it might be... Marais is super tough, but it might be a TKO by ground and pound in round two or three. Could be, yeah. It, it could be if if if, if Marais... Um... He's 35. If he's starting right. to lose a step or any durability or anything else. Yeah. And he got um, hurt really badly in the Luan Chagas fight as well. He did. It's true. Uh, odds on that fight. Kamaru Usman is the favorite, overwhelmingly so. Opened at minus 440, has dro- dropped steadily since now to minus 658, as high as minus 800 on some books. Uh, Ch- uh, Marias opened at plus 314, adjusted a bit, and has risen steadily to m- plus 463. Uh, any props? <laughs> There's yeah. no betting on those odds. Let's see. Under 2.5 is plus 205. So if you think that uh, Usman might stop him, there's that. Over is minus 245. Uh... They do have fight starts round two, round three, goes to decision, draw. Uh, Usman by TKO KO is plus 280. Sergio Marias by submission is plus 1035. <laughs> Don't be tempted, my friends. Don't be tempted. He hasn't gotten one in a while. I Honestly, Usman by TKO or fight um, the total under two and a half, both of those might be worth something. Like Marais... It's just, this is a it represents a pretty serious step up from Marais from the kind of guys he has been beating. Usman yeah. is a guy on a championship track, so that that might be the way to find value here. If you can Usman at any kind of underdog odds is is maybe some value for this matchup. And I, again, I don't mean to disparage our boy Sergio, but it doesn't look good for him from my perspective. And if you do throw money at the Marais by submission and it comes <laughs> through, then good on you. Yeah, and just remember it was Zane who advised you to do so and not Connor. And if it doesn't work, I never told you to do that. So. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll back you up on that. Yeah, I ne- I would never tell anybody to do anything betting-wise. I don't bet. There are reasons for that. <laughs> the reasons mostly being that I don't like losing money. Yeah, it's a good one. Uh, lightweight bout, Gregor Gillespie, Jason Gonzalez up next. And um, is this you or me? I've forgotten now. Me? No, this is me. Okay. All right. Uh, this should be... I feel like the UFC is kind of trying to slowly convince Gregor Gillespie that he needs to fight at featherweight. <laughs> Just like, yeah. oh, you're going to fight, uh, you know, make your debut against... Um, oh, who's the... Uh, against Glyco Franca, who's like six foot one lightweight. Then fight Andrew Holbrook, who's only 5'11", but was a pretty muscle-bound lightweight. And now fight uh, Jason Gonzalez, who's a 6'2 lightweight. And meanwhile, Gillespie over here is like 5'9", in <laughs> shoes, maybe? Yeah. Um, I do think Gillespie would be a better natural featherweight than he is a lightweight, maybe. But... He is a nonstop wrestler, mm-hmm. just unbreakable wrestler. You know, the kind of guy who will shoot and you shuck his takedown and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm stuffing the takedown. That'll take his confidence away. And then he'll shoot again and you'll stuff that one. And then he'll shoot again and you won't stuff that one. And maybe he'll get back to your feet and he'll shoot again. And maybe you stuff that one. He'll go, he'll shoot again. And he just does it nonstop round after yeah. round after round. And there's no making him stop wrestling. That was definitely Glyco Franz's experience of like seeming like he thought he was doing pretty good because Gillespie couldn't get him down. And then it just kind of wouldn't stop happening. And eventually he was exhausted and lost. Yeah. Uh, Gillespie's also 
tightened up his offensive boxing slowly but surely. Um, you, knocking out Andrew Holbrook isn't exactly a high watermark for your striking ability, but he looked good doing it. And he throws tight punches. That's the thing. He throw like Usman. We've talked about. He, like he throws tight punches and he does so with confidence mm -hmm. with confidence in his chin and with his ability to get through it which pe means that he's got the kind of mentality that's likely to make him a better striker down the road like having the confidence to go out there and do it is the kind of thing that makes you better at it i think a lot of the times yeah. you know you see the fighters who never really get better at boxing and a lot of that i think is just never developing the confidence yeah. to throw punches that's kind of what I meant with like a comparison between Usman and Burns. Like you could argue yeah. that Burns is technically the better kickboxer than Usman, but Usman is by far more effective. And yeah. Gillespie is the same way. Like no one's going to say he throws the best left hook in his division or anything like it. But the fact that a nine and zero fighter went out there against Andrew Holbrook and threw a liver shot to left hook upstairs, like he had the confidence to do a fairly advanced boxing move to finish that fight. And yep. He just went out and did it. And uh, Gonzalez is a absolutely go for broke, come forward at all times, throw anything and everything, high octane mm -hmm. sort of Muay Thai striker. And he's a good grappler off his back, tricky, uh, but he's set up to be taken down, put on his back, and just wrestled for rounds at rounds and i don't know that his cardio would necessarily hold up really well to not being in control he's mostly been a one round fighter a one round finisher over his career so ultra dangerous likely to just go out and try to put it on gillespie early and if he can't sh surprise him because gillespie's his d defense especially is still wooden he's still there to be hit so if gonzalez can come out and just hit a flying knee or something he could starch gillespie but if he doesn't it's hard not to think that Gonzalez with his frame and his activity, you know, his aggression level won't just tire out as Gillespie takes him down over and over and punishes him. So Gregor Gillespie, maybe even maybe by uh submission. Yeah, um Gonzalez is slightly fortunate. Gonzalez is kind of like a uh he's very similar to um Oh my God! Me and names today, Jesus Christ! Who's the Black Zillions guy who he knocked out? Um, remember the name, Bilal Muhammad. Remember the name is an ironic one. Who knocked out Bilal Muhammad with like a single left hook? Oh, oh yeah. Um, you can see there's something wrong with my Vicente Luke. Yes, Vicente Luke. You can see there's something wrong with my brain because I I can picture the knockout and I don't remember yep. the human's yep. name. So I am a sociopath, but um. He's kind of like Vicente Luke, and like Luke, he has the advantage against wrestlers that while he is not a good enough wrestler to stop the takedowns consistently of a guy like Gillespie, he he has like the front headlock submission game mm -hmm. to really mess with a guy who shoots on singles and doubles like Gillespie does. True. But you're kind of gambling if you're expecting that to win. Like he, the counter takedown with a guillotine has existed in various forms since the earliest stages at MMA and there's always been ups and downs of whether or not it works. It's never been a hundred percent reliable. It's a move that works if you can get it just right at just the right moment. And if not, you're underneath Gregor Gillespie. And I tend to think that Gillespie's aggressive enough with his wrestle boxing game that uh, Gonzalez is going to have to confront that situation over and over again. And I agree with you. I think eventually it's going to tire him out. And um, Gillespie is going to get him. A submission is not impossible, nor is a TKO ground and pound. I think I might go with a submission as well. Maybe Gillespie by like a rear naked choke in round two or three. Sounds about right. Yeah. Um, let's see. Odds on that fight. Gillespie is pretty good favorite. Opened at minus 565 and adjusted up and down a little since then and then has risen up to minus 443 starting to fall down. In fact, he rose up to minus 420 or so and is now falling down to minus 443. Gonzalez opened at plus 375, big adjustment uh, up and down, but has slowly fallen uh, to plus 338. Um, I, I do feel like there is, like, 
let's see, what's the prop on Gonzalez by submission? Mm -hmm. Gonzalez by submission is plus 1070. Gonzalez inside the distance is plus 490. Which isn't that much far that far off of where he is just straight well, win. But yeah, but Gonzalez yeah, straight win maybe. But I mean that yeah, there's definitely there's gotta be some angle because Gonzalez is it's not like Marais versus Usman where he's like completely outmatched, especially because Gillespie hasn't reached Usman's level yet in terms of yeah. competition and we don't know enough about him. So Gonzalez is he's also a good enough striker. Like it would not shock me if he stung Gillespie on the feet. I think Glyco Franza dropped Gillespie in their fight, uh -huh. and Gonzalez is kind of similar stylistically. And maybe uh, still a very wooden, straight up and down yeah. fighter when he's punching. Like he's he's yeah. got the confidence in his boxing. He's throwing the right combinations, but he's doing so with his head on line and his chin up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so oh. there's probably some value on Gonzalez. He's not a he is not a bum. Yeah, I still think this is absolutely a fight Gillespie should win, and that Gonzalez will take himself out of oh, yeah. position for take that or for, to win it pretty quickly. But it it'll be. I mean, Gillespie is a fighter that is always going to be battling much bigger men, and is going to be trusting on his cardio and his stick-to-itiveness to get him through some tough spots in fights. Mm -hmm. See, that brings us to a, uh, to the middleweight bout, Hector Lombard, Anthony Smith. Oh, this is a weird, this is you. That's right. Go. <laughs> it's a weird fight. I'm glad you started things off on the right tone. It's a, it's a hard one to get a hold of because Anthony Smith has had some moments without ever necessarily looking like a changed fighter altogether. Um, he's still been inconsistent, but has just come out on top impressively. And then Hector Lombard has not won any fights in technically hasn't won any fights since 2014. <laughs> but uh. has st still had serious moments in every single one. Um, you know, it like hurt Neil Magny hurt Dan Henderson and was competitive all the way through with Johnny Hendricks. So he's not done. You know, he, he's not like, uh, he certainly got something to offer, and he's still a powerhouse. He's still very fast. I'm sure he's losing some of that speed, but he's still very fast when he wants to explode. And that kind of stuff can really throw off a fighter like Anthony Smith, especially if Lombard can couple that with his clinch and with his takedown game. If he can get Smith in the clinch and drag him to the ground, it becomes a very favorable fight for Lombard. But it's Hector Lombard we're talking about. Um, you know, like, is he going to do the smartest thing to win is never, never a reliable uh, expectation. Lombard's ability to actually get fights to the ground consistently is really surprisingly yeah. kind of poor. Like, it just... If yeah, he's, he makes it look when he really wants to do it. Right, he rarely seems to do it. Yeah, that's why it's surprising because he he's good at it. Like his the way he flung uh, Jake Shields around, like holy shit, he's he's got the takedowns and he's got the top control too. You know, he's got the whole game behind it, but he is always this weirdly reluctant fighter. Maybe he's concerned about gassing. Maybe he's concerned about having his chin tested. Who knows? But he's always, since coming to the UFC, kind of failed to deliver on the exciting expectations that were created by his more one-sided fights in Bellator and, and elsewhere. And Anthony Smith is definitely tough. You know, he's not like the typical guy who's just going to go in there and get beaten up. Uh, he, he's He's got the reach. He's got the tools to use it. He's got a nice jab and kicking game. He has natural power. Yeah, I think I have to go with Anthony Smith, but I don't feel great about it because, like, if Lombard looks like he could look, he definitely has avenues to win this fight, whether it's by finding Smith's chin or by taking him down. And if he can take Smith down, Smith might gas and allow Lombard to have a much easier time of winning this fight. Smith has finally started to look a little better at maintaining his composure as a striker. But the grappling is still going to take a lot out of him, especially with against a powerhouse like Lombard. So 
it really is just like, is Lombard going to screw up or is he going to be like the Hector Lombard we have mostly seen in the UFC? And based on, you know, what evidence tells us, I have to go with Anthony Smith expecting him to survive one or two really bad moments to win a decision. <sighs> this is, yeah, this is an ugly call for me. <laughs> We've yeah. been agreeing all the way so far, so I'm just going to go out ahead and say this is uh, Hector Lomb. I'm taking Hector Lombard here. All right. Partially, a couple of things here. Um, Hector Lombard's durability has not really actually gone out the window. No. He's been knocked out for the – stopped twice for the first time in his career recently, which is a bad sign. But it was a attractive TKO against Neil Magny, really more exhaustion than anything else. And then that Dan Henderson thing was just Dan Henderson. It was just weird. Yeah. We've seen, you know, he's still been able to take multiple shots to get to a point where he might get stopped. Like it's mm -hmm. not like, oh, he's getting clipped and he's going out, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Hendricks hit him clean a lot. Yeah, and Hendricks hit him clean a lot. Didn't hurt him once, really. And um, the thing with Anthony, like Anthony Smith, even in his fight against Andrew Sanchez, which he is like his biggest win mm -hmm. to date, perhaps, um, for a guy that's been around since 2008 and fought 50 times, Andrew Sanchez may still be his biggest win to date. Unless you think a 2016 Josh Near is better, <laughs> um, I don't. <laughs> no. Well, Even I don't. That, I don't know. <laughs> he got really tired yeah. after round one, and then had to find a second wind. Yeah. Like, in, even in a slow-paced fight where he was doing well and reasonably in control and not getting overwhelmed, he even like he swept Andrew Sanchez. He kept the fight at range, at distance, didn't throw that many shots, didn't really wind up on anything. He still looked exhausted in round two and then had to battle back from that with an, a, a, an, Anth uh, with an uh, Andrew Sanchez who also has not learned that he can get tired. Like, that's kind of been a, a thing I've been watching for in Andrew Sanchez's career that came to bite him in that fight is that he fights like he cannot get tired and he does get tired. Mm-hmm. And at some point, like, you kind of got to take, stop taking really big, high risks while exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, Smith, otherwise, in that fight, I think, like, trying to slow down and be more cautious, he looks really awkward doing it. Mm -hmm. Like, he's lowered his base and his stance to stop takedowns. Didn't really help him that much early. He still got taken down when he got pressed against the cage. Yeah, I think he got taken down three times in the second round by Sanchez. And when he led against Sanchez, he looked really off balance. Mm -hmm. And when you know he's 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 really sharp on the counter, even out of his new stance still. And that's something that Lombard has to watch out for because Lombard, his ideal way of producing offense is to just wade in, plant his feet, and start winging hooks at you. So it leaves him open to be countered. Um, but it doesn't make Anthony Smith like a way, like an easy bet for me. You know, it doesn't... Anthony Smith is also easy to be countered when he wades in behind shots with, you know, because he gets himself off balance. And he's easier to take down. And he's just always struggles to implement. Like, he either knocks people out really quickly or he struggles. Yeah. And probably his fight against Elvis Mutopcic is the most complete win of his career. Mm. Where he didn't really struggle at all and was able to just implement a game all the way through. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I think whether that happens really depends on whether Lombard takes him down. Yeah. Or threatens a lot of takedowns. Yeah, or or just can like, you know, catch counter Smith coming forward. Sure. Or just again, maybe like I think probably at this point the takedowns are what caused Smith to gas because compare yeah. that to the Mutopchich fight, he did look 
like he'd found a little more comfort in, in just keeping yeah. volume up. But um, like it might just take one early takedown or the threat of one like foot sweep for Smith's output to dwindle and for him to start to get tired and anxious. And But at what? that point, does Lombard take risks enough to put him away? Yeah, I don't know. It sucks. <laughs> I it hate does. this fight, actually, now that I think of it. Judge. Um, I, I, I'm leaning Lombard. I just don't love what I see out of Smith on tape. And what I see out of Lombard yeah. on tape is a fighter who has problems keeping an even pace in fights and lets opponents have opportunities that he really shouldn't let them have mm -hmm. and can gas out when he just goes nuts on people and then can't check it. But who is still when he che when he tries to be a more dangerous fighter is a more dangerous fighter than Anthony Smith is fighting at a higher level. Yeah, you might have sold me on it, but since it's probably going to be our only disagreement of the card, I got to yeah. stick. I got to stick with Lionheart. It's it's a weird pick to make, honestly. Like I'm, I feel like I had another point in there that I was going to make, and I've just forgotten it all through. So. I just spent the last minute trying to think of some pun for the nickname Show Weather. <laughs> Is that still his nickname? <laughs> I think it might be. Ugh. Anyway. There's nothing there. I don't there's nothing there. I was like, I don't know whether, but it doesn't work because that's just a word. No. Okay. All right, let's move on. <laughs> Lombard opened at minus one sixty, adjusted up to minus one oh three, is now out to minus one eleven. Uh Smith opened at Plus 120 adjusted down to minus 120 and is now at minus 113. So after initial adjustments, Smith is a very tiny favorite. Yeah. Dead even sounds completely yeah. fine to me. It, it really is a fight that deserves to be dead even. Both guys have cardio issues. Both guys can be finishers. Both, you know, Lombard has fought at a much higher level with much more success at that level than Smith. Um. It's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. I'm leaning Lombard. I think I just don't like what I see out of Smith's game enough. Brings us to a welterweight bout: Mike Perry, Alex Reyes. Um, Reyes does not look like the right kind of fighter to beat Mike Perry. I agree. That is about all you need to say here. Uh, he has not fought anybody of reasonable competition. And watching some of his recent fights, or one of you know his, his recent fights, he gets hit even by bad competition. Like he is just not a good functional boxer, and that is a big problem. He is a very good. He's very good on top of people when he can t get takedowns, but. Most of his takedowns come from body lock and just changing angles on the body lock and pulling people down. And it's hard not for me not to look at that as a sign of really bad competition that he's facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Perry, you know, he has def major defensive holes. He's not the deepest skilled fighter in the world, but he knows that and he fights to that. And he's not really easy to take down. Not amazingly hard, but not easy to take down. Not easy to keep down. And he hits shockingly hard. And if Reyes is going to get hit hard early trying to implement his game, that just seems like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, for like a, a, a white guy with teardrop tattoos, Mike Perry's game is surprisingly unpretentious. Yeah, just it really is. Yeah. For some reason, your volume is just gone. Oh, it went back down again. You're good. I can okay. suddenly hear myself. Yeah, it's very unpretentious. It's like, I'm a good athlete. I hit hard, and I have pretty good form on my punches. Also, I can take a shot. That's the basis of the game. And, you know, to a fault, like, there could be some more nuance that Mike Perry could be picking up, and maybe he is. We just haven't seen it yet. But as it is, as it stands, it's a pretty effective game. Like, not easy to take down willing to come forward and eat a punch if he needs to, and really messes you up when he hits you, that's a good combination of uh, abilities to have as a fighter. Yeah, I, I was watching his fight with Jake Ellenberger again, and they were talking about, you know, and I, I was just like watching it, 
tuning out the commentary and they're like, yeah, I'm Perry Camp at uh, King's MMA. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then I realized they're talking about Jake Ellenberger's camp for Perry at King's mm. MMA. It's just like, oh, if he could go to King's. Wouldn't that be amazing? Mike Perry at King's. It would be so, like, just the right fit for the style of fighting that he's building. Yeah. Or Mike Perry with Henry Hooft or, like, yeah, there's there's options at Mike Ho- Perry. I, I would have reservations about Hooft's <laughs> and confidence breaking. He might put King, a little bit of though, weight which on Which is the... all about building confidence and, like, adding to your violent propensity moving forward. That just feels so good. <laughs> Yeah, Hooft would probably put a little too much weight on some of the masculine insecurities I am 100% certain Mike Perry possesses. Although, <laughs> if it were Alex Nicholson under Hooft instead of Mike Perry, Alex Nicholson would cry after the first day of training and then go on a murderous rampage. Because that is yeah, how much Nich- Henry... Nicholson is definitely the weaker, <laughs> the, the more fragile of those egos. <laughs> yes, I think so. Um, yeah, Reyes is just kind of... Uh, he kind of just smothers with his striking... Rather than like finding his ideal distance, he's too hittable, even by much worse competition. And he tends to either just kind of push people down or drag them from a body lock when they don't know how to avoid that position in the first place. He's not going to get there against Perry. I think Perry's probably going to knock him out in the first. Yep. Odds on that fight uh, just came in, just opened up at uh, minus. 425 moved quickly to my, minus 483 trending towards minus 500 for Mike Perry and Reyes opening at plus 355 and uh trending prob likely upwards towards plus 400 pretty quickly. I guess the one other thing we should say about this fight before we move on is that it is a shame that we're not seeing Perry Elvis because yeah. I think that actually had a chance to be a really compelling kickboxing match. And, um, you know, I'm glad that Thiago Alves is like seeing to his family and everything, but this is not that fight. And that would have been a really cool fight. That w- it would have been a great, great to see Perry against a veteran who does not have the elite high end athleticism anymore, but has found a lot of craft to his game mm-hmm. over the years against a guy that has the elite high athleticism and has not found the craft yet. Yeah. Just Al- Al- Alves would have been. As far as like Perry opponents, like how do you test Perry to, to to help him develop or to see how he does? Alves is like the perfect middle ground between a Jake Ellenberger and an Alan Joban. Yep. So it would have been great. And I hope they remake it because I still like that fight. Yeah. All right. That brings us to the main event now. Luke Rockhold, David Branch. Take it away. All right. Um, Dave Branch is used to neutralizing people. Uh, that is kind of the style for which he is known. He is a remarkably effective fighter who deserves a lot of praise for winning and holding for multiple defenses, two titles in World Series of Fighting. He's got the type of game that I think would always work in that context, jumping out around weights, fighting like opponents you don't have a ton of footage on, lower profile fights. Dave Branch would be like a great member like if he were a boxer in the 30s he'd be a member of the black murderers row where he has just developed this really subtle intelligent style that stops people from having their way with him until he can figure out how to outpoint them and beat them um it's not always exciting and it doesn't always work against really high level opposition and that's the problem that i think branch is going to run into here with rockhold it's not that technically branch is that far behind fighters like rockhold it is that stylistically too much of what he does relies on the opponent not getting to have their way and and rockhold he's got a guy who can probably kick and jab jab him pretty freely from long range which branch likes he's an all the way out or all the way in fighter um and to the second part rockhold is absolutely a force to be reckoned with inside uh he's going to be extremely difficult to take down if he's anything like the luke rockhold we saw uh in his last appoint last few appointments he is basically the anti-AKA fighter because he grew up at AKA and my feeling is that his game evolved to stuff the wrestling games of guys like DC and Cain Velasquez and to threaten them with submissions and fight them at the ranges and in the positions where they were worst. And it's really good. When people try to take Luke Rockhold down, I think that's when you tend to see the best of Luke Rockhold. Um, And I think we'll probably see that here. I think Luke Rockhold might have a harder time. Like, Branch is not quite a Jacare. Um, 
but he's maybe on the level of like a Tim Kennedy with his grappling. And I think that we might see Rockhold get to show off some of his really venomous counter submission game. Then we also have to mention the fact that Rockhold has also been training with the now oft mentioned Henry Hooft. And Rockhold strikes me as a guy who could do really well under Hooft. If if all the stars align, like Rockhold is a is an annoyingly self confident man. Yes. And probably won't be broken down. But I also think he likes the grind, the hard work. Um, he fit in very well at AKA for that reason. He's not a lazy fighter. He works very hard uh-huh. and he's a great athlete and was already a pretty good striker with a very shallow skill set. So Henry Hook is one been, of the, he's already been champion of the world. He's not going right. to go like, Oh man, am I failing? Right. Am exactly. I- and Hooft is like, if we're just talking, uh, setting aside all of the issues with like how he corners people and so on and so forth. And you know, some of the, issues with people that have been part of his team or at least the team he's chosen to associate himself with all of the domestic violence and stuff with those combat club and black zillions guys all of that aside technically he might be the best striking coach in mma uh yeah. he's actually he's certainly up there with guys like Dwayne ludwig and Rafael cordero and the like um brandon gibson so i hope we see rockhold really fill the space that branch gives him early with some impressive offense the likes of which we haven't seen before and if he does that branch is going to have to shoot at which point i think rockhold is going to start figuring him out if not just tie him up and 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 tangle him into into knots right away so i think rockhold by um i'll say a fourth round submission yeah i i like what you said you know you made the point brought it up before i could about rockhold having the anti-aka style yeah and like it fits so well for this fight where Dave Branch is very much sort of the AKA style. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, like it, it you're does. getting what you've seen for your whole career in the training room as your opponent. At least in terms of the wrestling, like Branch is yeah. he does a lot of the shit that Daniel Cormier would instruct somebody to do in the wrestling room. He is yeah. a wrestler. And the other thing is, you know, you watch like that Bisping fight again and rockhold wasn't doing too bad you know he was doing fine in that fight behind a snapping jab and some you know and and right hands at range and it was really you know they talked about him leaving his chin out there and all that and it's really the the left hook coming over the top of his of his jab right i mean because he's southpaw yeah yeah, he overextended on a jab and yeah. and and he, he, he the 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 left hook coming over the top of his jab that he had trouble with and didn't see coming and was a major issue. Like that is the thing that was there to take advantage yeah. of. David Branch doesn't really throw a left hook. Mm-mm. He has a nice jab. He throws a nice slap, or you know, a nice straight jab. But when he actually tries to follow it up with other strikes, like what you saw in the Yatko fight, was he would throw the jab, and then he would feint the jab once or twice even, and wind way up on a winging right hand, and a fighter reasonable enough to at keeping range like Yatko was, just stopped it from ever getting thrown. Branch just had to pull it back, and not throw the punch because he didn't have the range on it and he couldn't do, he didn't have any other, anything else to set it up with. Doesn't that make like, doesn't that make George St. Pierre the ultimate mystery? Because like technically and even personality wise, GSP is so much like Dave branch Mm -hmm. Um, and their games, like all the tools they like to use are so similar, but it just doesn't work for branch in this. It's like, it doesn't allow him to take over fights in the same way it did GSP. Even against lesser competition, it's always he's always having to work harder. I, I don't I think know why that, that is. Probably is because of who they were early in their careers and how massively different that was. You think it's like an athletic difference, like GSP? Not an athletic difference. I, I don't know that GSP is necessarily as crazy athletic as he's been made out to be. I mean, I, sure. I, I know that's kind of sacrilege to say because he was the pinnacle of MMA athletic performance for a while. 
maybe just that GSP, like that's the direction he pointed his like well-known insecurities in is like early in well, his career, he knew he could go after people and destroy them. Yeah. And, so, and like, you know, GSP came out with that. He had, he had a karate black belt and he had a lot of faith in his ability early on to just come after people with a high octane kicking game mm -hmm. as well as a wrestling game behind it. You know, really just kick the shit out of people. And David Branch has never had that. Mm. Like he never had, he had came out with a grappling background and some wrestling and has turned that into like, they evolved to the same point, but because the base functionality was so different, I think the comfort level has always been different. That's so what I was saying before. I'm now building a case for prejudice against jujitsu guys that maybe <laughs> as a combat sports background, it does not lend itself perhaps to the things you need to be a fearsome MMA fighter. I don't want to say that. I don't. Name me a jiu-jitsu dude in MMA with killer instinct. There are fewer of them than, than you would think there would be. I don't know. I'm not making any hard claims, but I'm there's not, something gonna, there. Th see, the, the problem right there is that if you actually want to go down that road, you have to re remember that like 95% of MMA yeah. fighters started with jiu-jitsu. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I mean, like, I could say Jose Aldo, and suddenly that's your true. point's really dumb. It's an erroneous argument. <laughs> <It's>, yeah. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Still, Dave Branch, looking so similar to GSP and all the things he does, is not GSP. And he would need to be a lot more like GSP to beat Rockhold. Yeah. Like, I, I just don't think that he can... I don't think he can tangle with Rockhold on the ground and make that work for him. And standing, he doesn't have this, the style that said like makes me think oh luke rockhold really like this is something that's going to be dangerous for rockhold i mean you know chris weidman was winning his fight with luke rockhold but he didn't put you know he didn't put rockhold out he didn't have him in the same kind of trouble that bisping or belfort did and bisping didn't even have that success the first time around yeah you know? and also rockhold didn't even may have been one of his worst nights in terms of like how he looked physically. He's normally a lot sharper than he was in that fight. Yeah. Like Rockhold has beaten Leoto Machida and Costa Filippu and, you know, he, he beat Michael Bisping. He beat Chris Weidman. He's beat good strikers. It's not like anyone who throws a punch is suddenly sure. Luke Rockhold's kryptonite. Yeah. So... It is weird that Luke Rockhold is essentially the redheaded stepchild of AKA. Like he's like the coolest, handsomest one, but he's like the one who doesn't fit in with the styles of Daniel Cormier and Kane Velasquez, these like ugly, lame dads. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that that makes me feel good. Oh Lord. All right. I think uh, uh, let's get to the odds on that note. Um, <laughs> Luke Rockhold is the favorite sizably. So open at minus 400 adjusted basically back to there and has dropped slowly to f minus 525. Dave branch opening at plus 280 adjusted up and down and is rising big jump uh, just in the past few days up to plus 352. Was it about plus 330? has jumped or up to plus 392 rather so has jumped way wider in the odds just in the past few days um i don't you know coming off his ko loss to michael bisping and an injury and all that i'm not saying you know rockhold could be closer than that i i, I i'm surprised the odds the odds are as wide as they are but i think this is a really good fight for luke rock yeah, I agree. I mean, it, uh, the chin seems like it's going to be a concern for Rockhold indefinitely. Uh, that we've seen him just, like, especially the Bisping shot really just shook him up because he didn't see it coming, and that's not a great sign. But, like, technically, if you're looking for someone to counter you with a hard left hook, which, by the way, is a shot that's very tricky to avoid even if you are a very technically savvy southpaw. Yeah. Like, the left hook is a killer for southpaws, just as a southpaw right hook is a killer for right-handers. Um, if you're looking for somebody to land that shot, I know he's pillow hands, Michael Bisping, but I would say that left hook Larry is a lot more likely to land that shot than Dave branch. Just the style of branch does not lend itself to those kinds of counters that are going to 
shut Luke Rockhold's lights off in an instant. No, even in that Jocko, J- Jocko fight when Yacht or Yacko fight when Yacko came after Branch and really tried to uh, be aggressive and punish him, Branch just tied up with him. Yeah. He didn't sit there, sit back and like hit a fadeaway counter or, you know, find the sharp opening for a counter strike. He just tied up with him and sucked the life out of the fight. That's what Dave mm-hmm. Branch does. He's not there to make extended striking exchanges. Yeah. Like you said, he is a lot more like the guys that Luke Rockhold has spent the better part of his career training to beat. The guys like yeah. DC, like Kane, like he is a wrestler and grappler. And that's been the one thing that has never worked that well against Luke Rockhold. Pretty much. All right. On that note, you can find us on MMA or on Bloody Elbow and uh, find our video over on MMANation.com on YouTube. D-O-T-C-O-M. That's our YouTube channel where you can find all the latest Bloody Elbow shows, videos, news, analysis, all that good stuff. Give, give us a like. That's the thumbs up thing. Subscribe. All that good stuff. Turn on notifications so you, you get – an email. I know you hate getting emails, but whatever. Do it. It helps. And uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Zane Simon. You can find Connor on Twitter at Boxing Bush, B U S C H. And uh, we'll be back next week for UFC Saitama breakdown, which involves a hour, full hour of me just crying over Takanori Gomi versus Dong Young Kim. <laughs> and it's not then, worth uh, the tears. Thirty it's minutes not worth on it. the entire rest of the card, except Gadella versus Andrade. <laughs> <laughs> Save your tears, Zane. It's not worth it at this point. Let go of Takanori. He's, he's... I, I have let that that's the problem is I have let go of him, but the UFC is still throwing him out there into fights to get deaded. This dude has not made it outside of round one since 2014. At what point, dude, like like Dana White and I don't know, Ari Emanuel dress up in like black stage suits and then just carry Takanori Gomi into the octagon and move him around to pretend that he's fighting. Oh, God. <laughs> like, yeah, a, the, like the poles on his arms. Yes. Like, <laughs> yeah, like puppets. They won't let they won't let the man's career end. Like, I don't want to see it anymore. No, I don't <sighs> either. All right. On that sad note, thanks everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time.